Well, greetings, everyone. Good afternoon. We are very pleased to uh, announce the arrival of Mr. Andrew Kimbrell, named by the uh, Guardian UK as one of the 50 uh, most people most likely to save the planet. So we have a real superhero here to speak with us today. I'm going to mention a couple more things, then we're going to introduce Rebecca Jepson, who is uh, intimately aware of uh, the need for us to eat in a sustainable way and to live in a sustainable way and lead uh, very green lives. And uh, so she's going to weigh in and give a great introduction to uh, Andrew. Uh, one other thing that I want to mention is that Andrew is a founder and executive director of the National Nonprofit Center for Food Safety, and that he's one of the country's leading environmental attorneys. He's also an activist and an August author. And without further ado, I'll get out of Rebecca's way. Rebecca Jepson, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rebecca, and I'm uh, basically the permaculturist and horticulturist here at Google. Uh, a lot of you hopefully have seen the um, United Nations Google Gardens that we have all around campus here at the Googleplex and Crittenden and Salado, and uh, I lead that project. I also do the green tips of the day, which I hope most of you have seen, and if you haven't, please um, you know, look as you start to go into the cafes, because every day we have a wonderful green tip that helps us all do a little better. And uh, I actually met, uh, I went to the Eco Farm Conference back in January, and, um, and, and, and got the pleasure, truly a pleasure, of hearing Andrew speak. And um, it was a life-changing event for me. I've been in high tech all my life. Uh, I am now dedicating 100% of my time to go out and teach people how to grow their own foods and the importance of growing soil and, uh, and, and how important it is for us to do a little bit better job with sustainability and, and looking at food. And, um, and as Justin mentioned, um, Andrew started the Center for Food Safety in DC. He's been an author, an activist, a lawyer for over 20 years. Um, he was voted one of the top people, one of the top 50 people in the world to, that, that will save our planet. And I truly believe that to be true. Uh, and without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Andrew Kimbrell. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sweetie. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's great to be here, and thank you, Rebecca, for that lovely introduction, and thank you for all of your work, and thank you, Google, for having me here. It's, um, I did work on a farm. You may wonder as I go through this, why is he talking about food? I have to say, I did work on a farm for about four years, but almost destroyed that farm, so they, the farmer at one point said, do you want to help farmers? Leave the farm and become a lawyer and help farmers. So I, uh, you know, I, I did that. So now I'm a lawyer. And worse than that, even though we have uh, the Center for Food Safety here in San Francisco and, and we have a wonderful office in Mission, and Rebecca Spector, who's sitting in front of me, is our West Coast director, so feel free to talk to her afterwards. Um, I'm a lawyer, and worse than that, I'm a Washington, D.C. lawyer. So I could not start this talk today without making at least one lawyer joke. Rebecca hates it when I do lawyer jokes. When I do lawyer jokes. So yeah, I'm supposed to be a bioethicist. I've written a couple of books on bioethics. So here's a bioethical question I was given by a cab driver. What is the difference between a lawyer and a sperm? Almost, almost, you can get B plus on that. Uh, the sperm has at least a one in one million shot of becoming a human being. <laughs> you can also say one in a million shot of actually working. That's another, that, that, that works as well. I was thinking of, of, of a way to bring this topic. So many of you who are here are doing such great work on this. I know Rebecca is, and, I, and just being around Google for the short time I have this morning, I've seen just all the recycling, all the dedication here to organic and local, and it's just, you know, you're all so well informed on this. And I was thinking of a way that I might present this, and then um, walking through that lovely little garden, you know, the growing connection that uh, Rebecca's. I thought maybe we'd talk a little bit about connections today and what it has to do with this work, and maybe all of our work. Uh, and so I want to take you back, and I guess I was also watching uh, the news last night with Obama and Iraq, and I was thinking, how can I make a connection to this? So many of the issues that we're facing uh, that we connect in with this work. And it brought me back to a time about, um, 30, 40 years ago, when we were in the middle of another war, and um, I was in high school, and um, part of the anti-Vietnam War movement. And a friend of mine said, Andy, you've got to go to this play in New York City. It wasn't even off-Broadway. It was like off, off, off-Broadway. It was like way off. And um, it was called The Rescue, and it was, this, it was a great anti-war play. So I went there, and at that time, the um, a lot of the anti-war plays were not very well written. Everyone was very serious, but they weren't very well written. And this, this was no exception, and the actors were very earnest. And uh, I have a problem with that. Uh, Laurence Olivier once said, 
I don't mind good actors, I don't mind bad actors, but I can't stand earnest actors. And I feel sometimes the same about activists. But this play began to take my attention. Here's the story I want you to, us to think about today. The story of the play went it like this. The, it was about an American pilot who was shot down over North Vietnam. He had gone on several sorties before that where he'd been bombing North Vietnamese villages and farms and sometimes intentionally and unintentionally. And he was shot down. And the play begins with him with a leg broken, coming away from the wreckage of his plane. And he's being pursued by a North Vietnamese army, by a lot of the angry villagers around. And he finally finds haven in a small farm where there's an old Vietnamese farmer there who takes him in and protects him. And when the army comes to the door, he says, I don't have anybody here. And when his angry neighbors come because their farms have been destroyed, he doesn't say anything. He protects the young man. And after a while, the young man begins to appreciate the farm. He begins to appreciate farming. He begins to understand the rhythms of the land. And of course, it's a play. So he falls in love with the beautiful daughter of the farmer and, um, and begins to find real peace there. And the denouement of the play happens when a Green Beret group comes in. They broke an international law to go to North Vietnam to find him and rescue him. That's why the play was called The Rescue. And they come in, and he's torn because he's here. His, his, these are his Americans. And he hugs them and he says, oh, gosh. But you know, he's also torn because he loves this place he's been at. And then they say to him, listen, you know, we have broken international law to get here. So unfortunately, we're going to have to kill these two people because they're the only two people that know. And it would, again, cause an international incident. We're not supposed to be invading you know, North Vietnam. He says, you can't do that. These two people protected me. They were, they, now, they've been there for me the whole time. You can't possibly do this. And they said, well, sorry, this, these are orders. And he begs and he pleads and he pleads, and he finally realizes, after many, many hours of arguing with them, that there is no other way. He says, well, at least, at least let me do it myself. So he takes them into a room, and he takes out his pistol. And after a little while, he shoots himself. And I remember after this play, there had just been the invasion of Cambodia, and everyone was talking about that. And I just sat in this sort of coffee house, and just something about this play got to me. There was something about it. Something that was riveting about this, this plot. And it occurred to me then that what was so extraordinary was here a man who could you know, drop ordnance on coordinates at 20,000 or 30,000 or 40,000 feet, which would, even if he didn't mean to, were undeniably killing dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of people. But when he was, had to do it face to face, people he knew, people he cared about, he'd rather kill himself than do it. And so it occurred to me that this is sort of like a pilot's dilemma for all of us, that what we can do at a great distance, we could never do close up. We can never do if we actually had to do it ourselves. And we're always, and I think in a, in, a, in a culture and in a technological industrial system where so much happens at this great distance, that becomes a dilemma for all of us as far as trying to live moral lives. How do we take responsibility for what we're doing. And nothing represents this more to me than food. Take, for example, the Happy Meal, right? McDonald's Happy Meal. I can't stand those little happy faces anyway, I have to tell you. <laughs> I did finally learn how to do it on my computer. You know, you have a thing, that and that, and you have a little happy face. And I was horrified to see you could also make a medium face and a sad face. Uh, and so I'm not, I think this is really one of the major challenges I now face not to use them on my emails. I'm going to try, but so far I've been using them. But what about, you know, the Happy Meal, when you really think about it, everyone's, you know, if you see the commercial, right, everyone's happy. But what if that mom and dad and little kid were actually in the slaughterhouse and actually had to be right there and see what goes on in those places? I've been in a couple, and I, I don't want to describe it in too much detail, but it is you know, one of the more traumatic experiences that I've had. What if they were there to see the forest being burned down? and the animals running, the grazing land destroyed for those cows. They'd run out of that place screaming, and the kid would never, 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 never come near there again. But because of the enormous distance between what's going on and that Happy Meal, they're not taking the consequences of that. And I think that this is true of our entire food system in many ways. Has anybody here ever seen uh, the Jetsons? Nickelodeon, hi. Jetsons, okay, what do the Jetsons eat? Does anybody remember the pills. little pills? Exactly right. They eat little pills. They eat them with a knife and fork, which is kind of interesting, by the way. You know? <laughs> and what do they drink? Anybody remember what they, what they, what they, they drink, the Jetson family? 
son's name was Leroy, was it? Was it was Elroy. Elroy. And the dogs is, is Astro, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what do they drink? What do, they, what do the Jetsons drink? Orange, this orange stuff. When we were kids, we thought it was Tang, because Tang was the drink of the astronauts when I was a kid growing up. Some of us, anyway, just, well, I'm a couple of years old enough to remember that. You know, it's, it's a cartoon, but you have to remember when it first came out, that actually was the ideal of what food was supposed to become. That wasn't considered, you know, satire. That was, they said, that's food's going to be, you know, we're all going to eat little tablets and drink nameless orange liquid, albeit we may still retain the knife and the fork. And that was sort of the industrial model of the food. Food was going to get more and more reductionist, we're going to use more and more chemicals, it's going to be more and more artificial, and that was good. And for a very long time, in my lifetime, that has been the model of food. But meanwhile, certain things were happening, like that Happy Meal, certain things were happening that mo very few of us were aware of. In my lifetime, we've lost over uh, 10 million farmers and 5 million farms. As a matter of fact, you, if you, on the census, U.S. Census, farmer is not even an occupation anymore in the United States. You have to list under other, because it's under 2% of the population. Right? During that time, we have lost about 90% of the biodiversity in our fruits and vegetables. Commercially lost it. Some people are still preserving it on their own. 75% of all the creatures on the endangered species list, 75% of there because of farming and ranching. We were talking about topsoil earlier at lunch. We're losing our topsoil at many times. Some people say 12 to 15 times faster than we can replace it. So right now, all of our food isn't being grown in the soil. It's being grown in oil. We're growing our food in oil. And all that, because of the massive farms, we no longer have agriculture. They took culture out of agriculture, and now it's agribusiness. So even the culture's gone. Right? And when I wrote a book called Fatal Harvest, The Tragedy of Industrial Agriculture, people said, oh, come on, Kimbrell, that's a little rhetorical. Well, I'm always a little rhetorical, but in this case, actually, we, we did some research, and in a 10-year span from about 91 to 2001, during, those, during that whole crisis in farms, an average of 50 farmers a year were committing suicide in Nebraska, a total of over 500 in 10 years. They, could, you know, they didn't know what to do when they lost their farms. And it's over twice the rate of suicide of the other highest suicide populations, which are, by the way, policemen and psychiatrists. So it really is a fatal harvest. So you know, when you look at this and you look at the hundreds of millions of tons every year of pesticides and toxins that are going into our air and our water because of the system, the loss of the topsoil, the loss of the diversity, and not even discussing what I was talking about with the Happy Meal, which is the, what the fate of the 10 billion animals, 10 billion animals every year, the unspeakable cruelty and, and, and unnecessary cruelty to those animals. Um, this industrial food system is getting away with a lot of, I'd use the word, crimes. And here's why. It's that same pilot's dilemma I was talking about. What's happened during my lifetime, is, and, and before it a little as well, is we've had a huge demographic change in our country, right? The vast majority of people in America, and we've, we're talking about this lunch, right? Indiana, and here, we're, we're brought up on farms. New Jersey, right? Farms, we have Indiana here. A lot of people were brought up on farms, but there was a tremendous demographic change after World War II, where the vast majority of people began to move to the cities at a tremendous distance. Tremendous distance from what was going on, where their food was being made, food was being grown. I recently talked to Kim Kennedy, a producer at CBS Nightly News. We're doing a series of shows on CBS Nightly News. And I was talking about this one company, Monsanto, which is now trying to garner control over all the seeds of the earth. They've got 24% right now of all commercial seeds Monsanto owns, and they're buying more and more every day. I said, well, if one company were trying to capture all the oil of the world, well, actually a couple are, uh, or the water of the world, that would be big news, but no one's doing this. I said, so you need to do this big expose on CBS about we need to have common ownership of seeds. And she said, Andy, there's a problem with that. I said, what? She said, no one understands what seeds are. Our audience wouldn't get it. I said, what do you mean? She said, they don't get the connection between seeds and food. Could you say Monsanto's trying to take over all the food of the world? I said, well, that's not quite accurate. It's the seed. She said, we'll have to find another word. That just shows you this distance, right, between an urban culture and where their food is being made. And behind this, I mean, I still remember commercials. They don't do so many anymore where all the farmers and the commercials were wearing, like, the overalls. And they had little farms. They were talking over the fence. I mean, even as they were destroying that culture, they were sort of advertising that's what still was going on. Because people in the cities, they said, oh, hey, farmers look pretty good out there. Right? 
And so they thought this was pretty much going to be it. They were going to be able to sell their chemicals, sell their huge machinery, monoculture, so there'd be no diversity in the crops, huge corporate crops, get rid of all the small farmers, and they were on their way to a Jetson future. That was going to be it. Bye-bye. But something happened. Something happened on the way to their future that they had not anticipated. Uh, spirits like Rebecca here and everyone else at Google that is doing this amazing work with organic, they didn't think this was going to happen. They didn't think any of us were going to show. They thought they had a clear way. But some people started breaking the distance. You know, I have a, an expression which is very hard for sometimes us guys, which is there's only healing through relationship. You know, a lot of us when we get hurt or we're in a traumatized situation, we think we kind of get isolated. But what you learn, any of us who's fought, who fought issues, whether it be addiction or, or psychological issues, no, that's not true. How do you heal yourself? You heal yourself by becoming in a relationship, by getting a relationship with others, people that can help. And that happened. That there was a few heroes in our culture who did this, who saw what was going on and started to say, I'm going to make some connections, growing connections, right? And the first is Rachel Carson. How many people have heard of Rachel Carson here? Right. What did she write? Silent Spring, right? It's her 100th anniversary this year, by the way, Rachel Carson. And she's a real hero. She's a real mother of the environmental movement in this country. And what Rachel said is, you know what? When they're spraying these pesticides to get rid of all the mosquitoes and everything else, the DDT isn't just affecting the mosquitoes, often not getting rid of them at all. But that is, we're seeing the, the leaves that are contaminated where the leaves fall on the ground. Then they de deteriorate in the soil. So all the DDT gets in the soil. In the soil, it contaminates worms. And a robin can eat 50 worms in a few minutes. So it's going into the body of the robin. Robin then cannot have offspring, and you have a silent spring. She made the connection. She said, don't just let that not be a connection. Have to create a relationship. And so that was one of the great heroes. And the other is Cesar Chavez. And I had the privilege of meeting Cesar Chavez. My mother worked with Cesar Chavez for a while. And Cesar Chavez said, listen, don't you dare go into a supermarket and buy grapes without thinking of who picked those grapes. They didn't just arrive there by magic. It's not a miracle. I'm trying to break that distance, right? Like the pilot, whose distance was broken between what he was doing, he said, you need to think about those people, those farm workers. Are they being educated? Are they getting pesticide poisoning? What's the life like for their children? Every time you pick up a grape. And what they showed us, and this is true of everything we're talking about with food, and so much of the other issues we deal with, it's not just an environmental crisis and a health crisis. It certainly is both. It's also a moral crisis of how do we break the distance. And then the organic movement started. Organic movement is now the fastest growing sector in American agriculture. So a whole movement came up. Now we have national organic standards. And then we have, that's only the floor. We were talking about this earlier. Organics aren't the ceiling. Organics just say, hey, I wish all corporations would go organic. I think that's great. But above that floor, we need to build, which is not in the organic rules, we need to build local. We need to emphasize local and appropriate scale. Humane, right? And those 10 billion animals. Please don't forget those. I've worked on humane standards, and we have some really good standards. Social justice. There's nothing about social justice in the organic. Nothing about what's going to happen to those farm workers. And biodiversity, to stop that monoculture and the death of the diversity of our seeds. We need to build together that house over the floor of organic. But meanwhile, industrial agriculture said, wait a minute, action, reaction, right? They said, we, you know, it's not like we're giving up, right? There's still the majority of agriculture. And not only that, they've decided they're going to go into the final industrialization of our food and animals through genetic engineering and nanotechnology. So we now have the situation where I mean, people here who farm or even have a garden, what happens when you spray your herbicide and it doesn't just hit the weeds, it hits your flowers or your crops? What happens to your flowers or crops? They die, right? Because herbicides kill anything that's green. And that's really inconvenient if you want to sell a lot of herbicides. Not a good thing, right? You want to be able to have mass spraying of a field where it would kill the weeds, but somehow magically the plants wouldn't die from all that herbicide. And that's what Monsanto did. Monsanto makes its living selling herbicides, and Dow, Syngenta, Bayer, and DuPont, the other companies, chemical companies, said, let's do that. So they were able to genetically engineer plants so when you spray them with herbicide, instead of dying like they would, they can withstand huge amounts of it. And 85% of all genetically engineered crops, we talk about it in the book here, out there in the world, in the United States, are herbicide tolerant. As a result, 100 million more tons of those herbicides have been sprayed on our land in the last 10 years, since 1997. So here, you know, you think, OK, folks, we already have too many poisons in our environment anyway. Let's reduce those. And here the industrial agri agribusiness folks say, no, we're actually going to massively increase them and actually change the very genetic structure of plants, the heredity of plants 
so we can spray more and more and more. They're also doing this in factory farming. Some researchers in Purdue University had a problem. You know, we have battery hens that lay eggs, but they're mothers, so they like to brood over those eggs. So they said, oh, that's really a problem. So you know what? Let's try and take the mothering instinct out of them. So they've done this experiment to take the mothering instinct out of hens so they can survive in the factory farm system. So you see this amazing moment we have here. Instead of changing our system so it fits the needs of our plants and animals, we're trying to change our plants and animals so they fit the system. So we see this amazing, we're at the, we're, so here's the future of food for the 21st century. You can see the industrial going further and further this way, right? Into the actual engineering of fruits and then organic and beyond going this way. And each of us can play a role in that. One of the great things about the food issue is you, we can, I can, you can all, we all make a change tomorrow. Whether it be for organic or non-GMO or vegetarian. It's not something you have to wait for. It's, listen, it's, if you ask me to give up my automobile, how, how many people will give up their automobile tomorrow? We have a hero. <laughs> I love that. Good for you. You know, it's really hard to control. I don't know where the energy here comes from. I mean, we, I don't know if we can control that as a company. If some, how many, many of us here might, would think that nuclear power isn't a good way to do energy, but we can't have that. They won't say, oh yeah, we'll make sure no nuclear power comes in here. I happen to be really against this war in Iraq, but my taxpayer dollars, I can't control that, are going to that. Food is a really empowering issue, and it's an ultimate moral and political issue, because we can make a change tomorrow. Everyone here sitting here can make a change tomorrow. You can say, I will go organic whenever I can. You can say, listen, I will never eat factory farm meat again. No reason to. I'm not going to go vegetarian, maybe, or maybe, yeah, you will. Right? You can say, here's a book. And we have a um, shopper's guide in the back. You can go non-GMO tomorrow, tomorrow morning. You can do it. And by doing that, you can make a change in your life that's going to make more delicious, more wonderful, more healthy food for you and fundamentally change part of the system. And with this, I think, comes kind of an, I've, I can feel it when I'm here. I, you know, I, I was um, at Patagonia. I gave a talk up at the Patagonia Corporation in Ventura, California. I can feel it there, too. With it, I think, comes kind of also not just a change of our patterns, but a change in the way we think. Because right? the one thing, what do they say about factory farming? When you, when you talk, this is terrible, it's hurting the environment, farmers are committing suicide, you're destroying the diversity, the topsoil, animals, plants, what do they tell you? I'm sorry, that may be true, Kimbrell. But it is what? It is a blank system. It is the most blank system we have. Efficient. Exactly. So, you know, efficient. Everyone wants to be efficient. Right? I think we're going to have the nanosecond manager soon. You know, a little tiny book, you know, you know. By the way, why are things getting smaller as my eyesight gets worse and worse? <laughs> is this a conspiracy against us getting older? I mean, and now, the end <laughs> People text message me, I'm hoping, how am I going to ever get back to them? I, this is, you know, I have no way to get back to these people. Help me, somebody, somebody that actually can see. Um, efficiency. Hmm. We all want to be efficient, right? Okay. What well, if I tell you I have two children, which I do, and um, a daughter and a son, and I treat them very efficiently? What? What? Okay, you know what efficiency is, right? Minimum input. In minimum time for maximum output. All right, minimum affection to the kids, minimum expenditure for maximum good behavior. Anything wrong with that? Good dad? Not so good, huh? What if I tell you I treat my friends very efficiently? <laughs> Two in the morning, you know. Andy, this is Beth. Ralph left me again. Listen, I've got to go to Google tomorrow. Inefficient friend. I have an English setter, Virginia, who is the most inefficient thing alive. I lavish food and affection on her, and she does no work whatsoever. She will occasionally chew a baseball glove or pee on the rug. And I lavish time and energy on this. Do we treat anything we truly care about in a solely on an efficiency basis? Do any of you? Hmm? Friends? Family? Pets? Come on. No one treats their pets efficiently. Get real, right? And yet we've taken this as the sole. Nothing wrong with efficiency, by the way. It's very good for machines. Good system, but it has to be balanced. And what do we balance it with, truly, when we think about how we are as people? What do we balance it with? What do you treat your friends with, or your pets with, or your family with? Yeah, even as an attorney, I can say the word love. Exactly, empathy, love, care, right? And I have never known a single person, and I'm sure when Rebecca talks about her change, you know, she's not making her change because she wants to see more efficient use of natural resources or human resources, by the way, that's us. Um, 
She does because she loves what she does. She loves these plants. She loves the seeds. I have never known a single environmental lawyer, a single environmentalist. I don't, don't know anybody who works for children's issues or works in animal issues there for more efficiency. We're there because we care about something. And interestingly enough, we did research. 75% of Americans get up every morning to take care of something. The business of America is not business. It's actually care. Those are the doctors, the farmers, the policemen, the firemen, you name it. All the people that work in government, non NGOs, 75% teachers get up in the morning to take care of something. And they're not going to make more money or less, right? By that. They're not going to make more money for teaching one kid better than the next. The firemen are going to go just as hard for a house in a poor area as a rich area. We're, we're really a care economy and a care of people as well, but we never emphasize that. So that's one thing, efficiency. We need to, we're never going to get rid of this system unless we change the consciousness. We can't just stop the bleeding, stop GMOs, go organic. We have to start thinking about the way we think as people. We're not going to save the earth simply by recycling. We have to change the way we think that's creating these crises. Right? There's an old story. It's a Native American story. Uh, and this tribe is sitting there, and these, these women are washing the clothes in the river, and they see a baby floating down. They say, oh my god, there's a baby in the river. And they dash out and save the baby. They start washing. Then they see two babies coming down. They dash out and save the two babies. Then they see three babies coming down. They dash out and save the three And then suddenly, babies are just coming down all over this. And they're just rushing out. And, uh, and finally, the chief, then she comes in and she says, maybe we should go upstream and see who's throwing the babies in the river. And those of us who are fighting so hard to stop the GMS, stop this factory farming, stop the cement plant from coming here, trying to save the environment, we need to keep stopping the bleeding. We also need to change this consciousness, and efficiency is at the core of it. Balance efficiency with empathy. There's another big, big word out there that is behind this system, right? And that is, we need to be blank to beat out somebody else. What do you need to be? Competitive. Competitive. I need to bring you to all my talks, by the way. There's two in a row for you. This man's got it. Com competition. We need to compete in a global economy, right? We all need to compete. Again, nothing wrong with competition. I'm a big NFL. Big sports fan. But wait a minute, let's get back to my kids. All right? My son Nicholas comes in with Nicholas comes in with an A, and my daughter Kailani comes in with a C. Honey, you're gone. <laughs> you are the weakest link. Sorry, it's over. I mean, I have to prepare you to be competitive in a global marketplace. You're done. Over. Competition is the ethic of isolation. It's the ethic of trying to destroy someone else so that you can achieve. It has winners and losers. How do we really, I mean, if you want to get a project done, any project here, what do you need to balance competition with? Again, competition's the finest place, but what do you need to balance it with? Cooperation, exactly. Any team, you know, even, even in a competition, it's the team that is the most cooperative that wins. So just we need to balance efficiency with empathy. We need to balance competition with cooperation. And then there's another word that they use all the time, particularly when talking about organic and these things. They say, you know what? I think you guys are great, but I think you're against progress. We're kind of alarmed that Google is going organic, because that's not progressive. But we're not, we're not going to make progress. We need to use nanotechnology and all these things to change our food. Progress. Are you against progress? Well, it seems to me it's an incomplete sentence, right? Never let anybody use the word progress and you say, progress towards what? What's your vision of progress? What should a corporation look like? How should a corporation act? What, what should it be its care for the people that work for it? How big should a city be? What should a farm look like? Is a big industrial farm with all those poisons, monocultured, with no farmers there at all, with patented seeds by a couple of corporations, is that progress? So never let anybody use that word progress without saying, you tell me, what is your vision of that? What is your vision? Don't tell me abstractly, this technology, this particular practice equals progress. I want to know your vision behind that. Vision behind that progress. So we can redefine progress towards what we want. One of the most discouraging things I find when I lecture at universities is I tell these to the kids, and they have no idea that they can actually change anything. I can change that? I could change the system? I could change a corporation? I could change the way something behaves? They go, yeah. There's almost no, there's, can I really do that? Yeah, you, your progress is yours. You define it. And you decide. And you debate that. You decide what progress you're going to make. So when you, you know, there's sort of a, one of my great teachers was Ralph Nader. Now, I know Ralph's had some problems lately. 
but he was my teacher and I owe him a lot. But one of the things Ralph did, he started the consumer movement, right? And he did a lot of great things, but I have a problem with the consumer movement, right? Do you know what they used to call tuberculosis? Consumption. Consumption, because it consumed the bodies of its victims. Fires consume. Are we really consumers? Or do we want to be consumers? It occurred to me a while back that that's very disempowering. I think whether we like it or not, we're all creators. Everyone in this room, including me, we're all creators, right? Every decision we make about the food we buy, the food we grow, every decision we make is a creative decision. It will, remember that, the future of food for the 21st century, industrial versus organic and beyond? Every decision we make on the food we buy, the food we grow, how we behave in this marketplace is going to create one future or not, whether we like it or not. Walk into a fast food place, you know what future you're creating. I know what future, I'm not above this thing. I go to restaurants, I'm not always on top of this. I'm not preaching from the top of the mountain. I'm sort of saying, hey, we're all here together trying to break that distance, trying to heal through a relationship. But it's really important we recognize this, that me as well, that every time we do anything, we are creating one future, that, a different future for the soil, topsoil, a different future for the diversity of crops, for the suffering of those animals for the health of our bodies and our communities every time we make a decision. We are, whether we like it or not, creators. We are not consumers. We are creating one future or the next. And that's how we break the pilot's dilemma. That's how we break that distance in everything that we do. You know, and you might want to extend it. I, was, I gave this talk at EcoFarm and mentioned this, and a woman came up to me and said, it's not just about food, Andrew. She said, it's about everything. Don't just read poems, make poems. You know, just don't listen to music, make music. Right? I, I wonder sometimes how many people's greatest friends are friends on television. You know, I, a lot of times in, in our office, everyone says, oh, well, this is a few years ago, oh, did you see what George did yesterday with Elaine? Seinfeld, right? Have we substituted consuming objects for even our friends, our family? So I think sometimes that um, it's really important to, be, to, to remember that we are creators in everything we do. And the more creative we are, the more we change what we do, the more creative we can imagine ourselves. This brings me to what the th guy said this the other day at some award ceremony in San Francisco, and I loved it so much. He said, you know, Martin Luther King did not, um, did not say, I have a nightmare. You know, everybody, I have a nightmare. And racism was a nightmare for many, right? What did he say? I have a... I have a dream. And one of the wonderful things about what's happening here, what's happening in this food revolution throughout this country, and you can see it everywhere. I'm seeing organic milk at 7-Elevens and at gas stations. I'm just amazing what's happened, is that there's a dream of a sustainable food future. There's a dream of a new way of treating our, our, our soil, our farmers, treating these animals, treating our own selves, a new way of really living with food. And that's a real dream that we can realize tomorrow by becoming creators and not consumers. Thank you very much. And please, any questions? And there's a mic here. So since, hello? Since I'm, uh, I introduce people, I rarely ask questions. But I've always been pretty uh, curious as to what some of the uh, intellectual objections to genetically modified uh, food are, so I can go out and uh, spread some of the, the wisdom. Right. Thank you. Uh, for a good question. Yeah, we're the, we at the Center for Food Safety have, have, have worked, uh, both in our offices here in San Francisco and in, in Washington. Uh, one of our major issues, I mean, we, we promote organic and beyond. We deal with almost all the food safety issues you've been hearing about, but GMOs is one. That's what this book is about. And let, let me um, just tell you quickly, did people here ever heard of the Human Genome Project? Remember the Human Genome Project? Okay, that was going to check all the genes, right? There were supposed to genes of these little pieces of DNA. 98% of DNA was supposed to be junk. I love, the, I love the concept. 2% were supposed to be our genes, the code for proteins that makes us who we are, right? And then we're going to discover all of them. And because we have all these synapses and do all these things, they figured we'd have about, oh, 100 to 200,000 genes. And they spent $3.5 billion in about 10 years figuring it out. Does anybody know how many genes we actually ended up having? My staff doesn't get to answer. 18,500. A lot less. 18,500 genes. For example, the Pinot Noir grape, one of my favorites, sometimes too much so, uh, has 40,000 genes. The grape has twice as many genes as we have. Corn has 35,000. Mice have 35,000. 
We have as many as a nematode, a worm. That's confusing. Not only that, we have almost the same genes as everybody else has. We share 70% of the genome with a sea urchin. I mean, sea urchins are great. Don't get me wrong. But 70%? Now, if you knew some of the people I know in Congress, you could, some of this begins to make sense. But what really happened is they discovered that heredity in all living things was infinitely more complicated than they thought. In the 1950s, they invented this model of the gene being the CEO, and then it talked to the RNA, which was the messengers, then they talked to the proteins, which are the workers, and create us. Kind of a top-down model, you know, like the typical corporate structure in those days. And what we have found is not true at all. It's this incredible dance. The proteins are doing this with the RNA, RNA is playing. And remember that junk DNA? Mmm, not junk. Right now, if you, if you follow the cutting edge science, they think that a huge amount is actually in that supposed junk. So one of the intellectual arguments against genetic engineering right now is, we don't know. You see, they thought that by engineering just a little gene, they could change the whole organism. And that's not true. So they've tried to make drought resistance plants, they've tried to make more yield. They haven't been able to do it. That's why 85% of all the plants out there have this one little trick that helps them resist herbicides. And that is important to know because you will hear that genetic engineering is increasing yield, feeding the world, making less pesticides, simply not true. As you can read in the book, they have not been able to do any of that. And they probably won't until we understand a huge amount more about actual heredity. And that's why no one's been cured through genetic engineering, no human being. That's why we don't have any successful farm animals in genetic engineering. Because it turns out it's more like, heredity is more like a spider web. It has all these feedback loops. And simply mecha mechanistically changing one little thing didn't do it. They were able to achieve some very minor results, and that's going to be it. And the exciting thing about that, for any of you interested in it, is it's a whole new world of biology out there. It's a really exciting new field to really begin to understand this very beautiful and complex web that heredity really is. And by the way, that includes, of course, our heredity. Uh, so the human genome ended up proving its opposite. The genes were not the CEOs, and that we face a whole new world of understanding heredity and, and, and life. And additionally, I think it is important to remember that the five companies that do genetic engineering of foods are Monsanto, Dow, DuPont, Syngenta, and Bayer. What do they all share? I said it before. They're all chemical companies. And what do chemical companies do? How do they make money? Sell chemicals. So when they tell you we're feeding the world, they're not. There's, that actually, there's a slight drag on yield and soy and other things. What they are is selling a lot more chemicals. And they're being very successful at it. And again, another thing they're doing is they are trying to turn those foods into fuel. Right? And there's this huge craze for biofuels. Now, by the way, there's a very interesting field called cellulosics. And that's about 10 years away. That, I think, has a lot of promise. But biofuels, we're now realizing, actually have a net negative effect on global warming. And a World Bank report that was suppressed but has just come out is saying that about 75% of the world hunger we're seeing right now, the increase in world hunger, I should say, is because they're taking all this food and trying to burn it for fuel. And ironically, they're growing almost all this food in fuel. Oil, right, the fertilizers. So they're actually growing all this food, cutting down this forest to grow their soy in oil in order to get, stop our dependence on oil. Now, thank goodness the EU and a lot of countries now are saying no to that. Uh, but it's certainly not the way to go. We certainly cannot take all the food of the world and try and turn it into fuel. But again, there is cellulosics, which is something I think that we should go into. We've written on this. If you get on our website, the Center for Food Safety website, I've just published a, a lot of, of several editorials on this. And we've got all the facts that you would want to know on, on those issues. We also have gone to litigation. We filed a suit here in the Ninth Circuit to stop the spread of genetically engineered alfalfa, which is herbicide tolerant again. And we won. The court here said that the biological contamination of these genes jumping and creating super weeds and contaminating organic and conventional crops was enough to stop it. So it's the first time one of these crops has ever been stopped. We're really proud of that. Um, and so um, and it's now been, this biological contamination has been recognized by a court, so we're really pleased with that. Please come to the mic. Um, echoing on your last question, um, I I'm curious to hear your opinion about the major juggernauts on your way of combating the say, slant in the agriculture, in particular soybean, uh, food being grown for fuel and cotton. And as we know, these are probably the most filthiest things you can possibly grow, but at the same time, they are grown in the largest numbers, and there is a huge symbiosis between the industry that services these plantations, right, or, or fields. How do you envision disentanglement of this huge system? Oh, good question. Um, very good question. Rebecca, you want to answer that question? No? That's a really good question. Um, well, let me 
let, let me start. I, I, uh, did, did anybody here know about bovine growth hormone? Right, they've, they've synthetically, genetically engineered uh, the growth hormone in cows and they re-inject it. It's sort of like what some athletes in this area have done. They, they, they actually take the growth hormone and they re-inject it to try and have the cows become super, super productive, right? And I filed litigation against that in 1992 and um, lost. Uh, we lost because they said that our science was good, but they had to give discretion to the government science. And I, I was very depressed because I knew what, what this was. And if you look, by the way, it's called Pozolac, the product. If you look at the side effects on the cows, it devastates cows, absolutely devastates them. Not just laminitis, but increased mastitis. I mean, it's just a devastating product on these cows who are already being stressed in many of the commercial dairy farms, large commercial dairy farms anyway. It's not a, they're already under tremendous stress and suffering. So it was just, it really hurt. I mean, it's one of those cases that you lose and it hurts. You know, it's not just another law case. This is, you, I knew that the fate of all the thousands, maybe tens of hundreds of thousands of animals lay on this. So I, I called my brother and I just was really depressed. And um, my brother's kind of a cynical guy, actually. When he says good morning is an unproven hypothesis, for example. When you say good morning, he says unproven hypothesis. You know? uh, but he said something that really made a big difference to me and I think it make a difference to all of us in our work. He said, you sound like you really wanted to be successful, Andy. And I said, yeah. They said, you're not called to be successful. You're called to be faithful to what you believe in. And so I think if you do what you believe in, I'm, that's why I don't get burned out. I've been Washington, D.C., 22 years fighting these joggernauts. Think about the farm bill. The farm bill, talk about, the farm bill is almost as filthy as the cotton and soy industry. I mean, it is unbelievable the deals that go back and forth. I mean, it's just terrible. But as long as you keep, you know, we've made slow progress on conservation. We've made slow progress on, on, on organics and beyond uh, research. And you just, you just stay faithful to, to you, know, you're, you know, it is a David and Goliath a lot of the time. But, you know, what choice do you have? Once you know where you need to go, once you have that vision of the future for yourself, you can't hide it. You can't wake up tomorrow and say, I didn't, no, 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 no. I know that I know what's happening to those 10 billion animals, but I don't care. I'm going to just keep eating my dog. You can't do it. You can't do it. You have to change. You have to become a creator. And so I think that's when we are seeing a change. You know, when I first started working at the Park Slope, anybody here from Brooklyn, New York? Any New Yorkers in the audience? Okay, Park Slope, right? I mean, yeah. the great co-op there. I started working in 1976, and um, everyone said, "Oh, organic. That's for former hippies," of which I was not, by the way. You know, former hippies, and you know, it's just it's a little fringe. It wouldn't realize. I mean, they wouldn't. I mean, Whole Foods, these corporations just diving into organic right now so fast that we have to try and protect the standards to make sure we don't lower the standards to their, to their practices. And we've succeeded in that, by the way, up to this point. Um, so, you know, no one would have imagined that Nelson Mandela was going to get out of prison and, and run South Africa. I mean, certainly I never thought the Berlin Wall was going to come down. And that, I mean, it is amazing, those juggernauts, my friend, that we can change if you just have faith and stay with it. And I think changing industrial agriculture is already happening. It's just becoming part of that movement, you know, part of that organic and beyond movement. But they are significant. Yes, they control Congress. A, you know, we often live in more in a corporate oligarchy than a democracy, no question. But we're seeing the changes. We're seeing it happen. So that's sort of my emotional response as well as the fact that we are seeing some major changes. And we certainly see in the courts. We're seeing in the states. We're seeing around the world on GMOs and other issues. And um, again, if you want to get involved in some of these, just check out our website, CFS, and we can steer you into a direction that you might want to work in. Thanks. Great talk. Um, I, I wonder if you could just touch on a few things. Uh, the, the ability to patent seeds recently is kind of new. Maybe you could touch on that a little bit. Uh, um, also, maybe touch on the fish genes in food that they're splicing in. Like, fish genes and tomatoes, yeah. And then uh, um, you talk about a shared vision for the future of food and stuff like that. I'm just wondering, what, what, what is that future? Maybe just give us a little idea of what you're thinking, what people in your field who uh, Good question there. What's currently happening? Where where would you like to see it actually go if we could pick a traje trajectory? Thanks. Great, thanks. Real quickly, uh, what happened in, in 1980 in, a, in a, a decision called the Chakrabarty decision, Supreme Court decision, a General Electric guy named Ananda Chakrabarty created a little microbe, Pseudomonas fluorescence, that actually could eat oil. And so GE said, let's patent it. My God, we got this microbe that could eat oil. It could be good for oil spills. Let's patent it. So they went to the patent office. Patent office says, you can't patent a bacteria. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a product of nature. We've never allowed. You've got to have a machine, a manufacturer. You can't patent, like, bacteria. So they appealed it, and they lost. Then they appealed it to the Supreme Court. 
And in a five to four decision, the Supreme Court, yes, we're going to allow the patenting of this bacteria. Now, it turned out it was not ever used because it didn't just eat oil, it ate a lot of other things for dessert. It turned out kind of like, ate just like everything. Uh, so it was never used, thank goodness. But um, in 1985, this is during the Reagan administration when they really opened up all of this stuff, right? And I know he was praised a lot. I have some issues with him. But um, in 1985, they extended that patenting to plants. In 1987, they extended it to animals, including human genes, cells, and even human embryos, all patentable. And uh, so we tried to fight a case in 2002 and lost in a two-vote decision. The Supreme Court saying you shouldn't be able to patent seeds because they're products of nature. Uh, Clarence Thomas wrote the decision, one of the few decisions he's written. And of course, he did not recuse himself, even though he was a former lawyer for Monsanto. So right now, uh, fortunately internationally, because of what happened in Seattle and Cancun, there, the, no country around the world is forced to accept the patenting of seeds. They were going to try and extend that to the World Trade Organization and the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade. They were not able to do that. So right now, uh, third world countries where we go in and try and patent their germplasm, they can resist. We've been part of uh, CFS. We've been part of uh, the Basmati. People heard of Basmati rice? A Texas company patented Basmati rice. So uh, we went in and challenged it with the, and uh, worked with our great friends, in Vandana Shiva and other wonderful people in India, and, and stopped them. We, that, that we got that patent rescinded. They recently, uh, University of Texas, uh, patented a beagle, a dog, the beagle they were using in experiments. So we went there and we challenged it legally. Really good guy helped us do that in our office. And we also got all the students activated. So they put beagle stickers all over the president's car and stuff like that. You know? And they rescinded. They, they just gave up. They, they gave up on the beagle patent. We recently also stopped them patenting rabbits. They were taking these chemicals and putting them in, the eye, in the eyes of rabbits. And uh, we got that patent uh, halted about, uh, about four months ago, five months ago. So we're, we're going patent by patent. We stopped some broccoli. Rebecca, you may know some of the other patents we've stopped. But unfortunately, that, that, still, that patent system is still in place. And so here's what happens. Let me give you the, I'm, I'm going to keep you guys too much longer here, but here's sort of what goes on. Monsanto, basically, and a couple other companies, their, their idea is they already own, Monsanto owns 24%. If you add DuPont down, I think it's about 53% of all the commercial seeds. So they, this is how they're going to control the seeds of the world. They're doing it right now. They buy up the seeds. They patent the seeds. They also can then have technology use agreements, kind of the Microsoft idea, right? You get everybody locked in on kind of a monopoly thing on their pesticides and herbicides and the seed. And they're working on something called the Terminator technology. Have people heard about this? All right, so what Terminator technology does, and there's 15 different patents on it, but Delta, we're disagreeing on the name, Delta Pine and Land and Delta Land and Pine. Anyway, I think it's, I think it's Delta Land and Pine, but I may be wrong. Uh, Monsanto just bought them up. And Terminator means that the seed essentially commits suicide after one growing season. So your farmer has to go back to the company every year. If they can get that done, they don't need the patent. They don't even need the technology use screen. It's in the plant itself. And several of these technologies are genes, suicide genes. Imagine we've seen the, the genes escape already for herbicide tolerance. What if the suicide genes escape? What if you have you know, a corn crop over here, and then suicide genes escape into it, and that crop commits suicide after one growing season? Talk about starvation. So that's, and I, it's really unfortunately the USDA has, shares that patent. So that's the idea. Buy up the seeds, and then through patenting technology, use agreements, and terminating technology, control all the seeds of the earth. That is sort of the, uh, and unfortunately they're well on their way to doing that. But I just was in Africa, we're going, in Europe, and there's this tremendous movement to stop this and successfully stop it and protect indigenous seeds. And that, and that movement is here as well. We have seed savers in this country, we have tremendous people. Um, Jason here, is, Rebecca, is working on farms. Was, you know, these people are protecting. Jason, you want to show me how many varieties of lettuce that you were growing? Well, not so much in Los Altos, but probably 15, but on the coast, four. The Parisima Farms, yeah? Yeah, it's about 50 or 60. 50 or 60. I mean, and they were the most beautiful lettuce. I mean, they, they had the most beautiful shapes and sizes and tastes. It was just fantastic. You had this pen knife, and it was just, it was just, that diversity still lives. And we need to protect it from this onslaught. And as I said, I've traveled around the world, so you know, I think that's a possibility. Fish genes and tomatoes. What happened was that a, a company decided to try and let tomatoes grow in lower temperatures and also have them frozen longer without being breaking apart. So they, they found the gene, the antisense gene in flounder that allows them to grow at lower temperatures, decided to put that into the tomatoes. And it was called the McGregor tomato. It came out in the early 90s. It was called the flavor saver. Tomato it was the very first genetically engineered food. The other ones didn't come out until 1997. 
And um, unfortunately uh, for them, it failed. There was no flavor to savor. Uh, it actually finished last on all these uh, taste tests. It was kind of mushy. And oh my god, somebody needs to write the biography of the tomato, the poor tomato. I tasted some of your delicious little cherry tomatoes today in, in your garden. But well, what they've done to the tomato is it's, it's, a, it's a botanical crime anyway. But this, thank god, was one crime that did not make it uh, through. Um, and so the flavor saver tomato stopped. But they have. I mean, they've taken the fly, firefly genes and put them into tobacco to have glowing tobacco. Uh, you know, they've done a lot of these things. But again, because of the limitations of our understanding of heredity, this new exciting science, which, and by the way, if, you, and if there's any science guys out there, I'm kind of a nerd on this, so I'm not going to bore you with it. But it's something called ENCODE, E N C O D E. And if you really want to get cutting edge, that's what's going on right now. And it's been reported, but. And it's pretty easy to understand. They really will show you the new complexity and heredity. It's fantastic. So that's why they have not been able to create more, um, more crops. You know, the, as far as the food future, I think there's some, if, there's some tremendous organic research programs going on. There's some new ideas that are really, really happening as far as everything from irrigation to I mean, solar irrigation. Very exciting new technology that's there. And, I, and if I were an engineer today, it's one of the things I would go into. It's very exciting. New appropriate scale technology, particularly having to do with irrigation. Um, and, but having said that, it's also important to realize our future is our past. You know, we tend to think of progress as eliminating the past. But if you go to a psychotherapist and you say, listen, I'm having these depression moments, he doesn't say, good, let's forget your past. What's happening right now? Right, what, what do you do? You immediately go into the past. Real progress, whether you look at the cycle of, a, of the salmon or a crop, integrates the past. It doesn't cut it off as, as irrelevant or passe or outmoded. And, and in the, my book, Fail to Harvest, I have an essay by Jim Hightower. Do people know Jim Hightower's books? He's really, really great. And Jim Hightower, he has a, a chapter in there called My Uncle Ben. Uh, his uncle Ben did not go to the big pesticide industrial agriculture thing when it came out after the Second World War. He stayed with what he was doing, which is what we call organic. Everyone said, you're old-fashioned. He said, I'll just stay old-fashioned. Then about 10 years ago, he became cutting edge. Because what he was doing was considered cutting edge, local, organic, sustainable agriculture. He had all these techniques. They said, oh, we've got to find out what Uncle Ben's doing. He's able to do this without pesticides and all these things. That's fantastic. So as we have all these new technologies, we also really remember that our future is in our past. As far as exactly what that looks like, again, I would give you this image, and I think this is really important. We have a thing at the Center for Food Safety, and by the way, on that table over there is a huge number of our materials. So please feel free to go over that. And I'm also happy to sign anyone's book that wants it. But our view is not organic or beyond. It's organic and beyond. So you might hear Michael Pollan, I know Michael spoke here, say local is the new organic. We're not sure about that. If you know your local person, that's fine. But if you don't, are they using a pesticide? If your kid gets leukemia, is it a local leukemia? And if you're using pesticides that are not made locally, are you still local? So why not go organic and local? That way you know it's not being used. Organic and humane. Organic. So we have the house above it. Here's the five principles, if I forget one. But Rebecca will remind me after she finishes sneezing. Um, it's local, appropriate scale, humane, socially just, and biodiverse. That's the house. That's the future we want to build over the organic floor. And numerous groups across the country are building, a, are building that house. And I urge everyone here who's, who feels called, who has the vocation to do this, to please, again, if you get on our website, we have links to all these other groups and everyone that's, that's, we all work very closely together. So that's the vision, to build that house over that too. So, and by the way, I think a market premium is a great way to do it, which is how organic worked. And an and a industry, NGO, farmer, which is how the organic was created. That we're trying to create that in each of these other areas, so there'll be real regulations, so that you know you're not, you can trust it. The new, the new, that new food future, which again, I hope will all help create that dream together. Thank you very much. Anybody has other questions? Come on afterwards. We'll sign books.